point is, when the, in the Greek uh, mythology, we, when we see the gods are this symbolic for the goodness, but here, when we see the gods are the symbol of the, mm. the fire and comet and destruction. Well, you know, in, I think in the pantheons you had, you know, in, in Greek you had Hades, you know, in, in um, the Norse tradition you had Loki, who was an evil, destructive god, a tr god of trickery. In the tr tr Christian tradition we have the devil, Diablo, or Lucifer, who basically fulfilled that same role. And I've shown you in a couple of examples how if you actually go into the original interpretation and etymologies of some of the passages describing the devil in the Bible, they're very strikingly consistent with a lot of other traditions in attributing to, I mean, remember what, what was unique to Lucifer or the devil? Wasn't he the fallen god, the fallen angel? Mm. Absolutely, see? And the so what, what we're seeing is star, what? The bright morning star. The, right, the bright morning star. I mean, what does that association have to do? <clears throat> but see, it's all mixed up. Once you get past a fundamentalist literal interpretation, you get in, right, at the very end of the book of Revelations, in words attributed to Jesus, he says, I am the bright morning star. I am the, the root and offspring of David. I am the bright mor and morning star. Well, why is he identifying himself with exactly the same attributions that were given to Lucifer? Right? That was the last <coughs> spoken words of Jesus as quoted in the Bible. Okay, so explain that then? No, I'm not, no you have to think about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> see, that, that, that same idea is actually reflected on other levels. When you go into the Kabbalah, which is... Trans, which is a whole weird system of translating the Bible symbolically, okay? In, in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, remember you had the story about the serpent in the garden beguiling Eve and telling Eve that, oh, did, did Yahweh tell you to not eat of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge? And she says, yay. He says, if I eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, I will surely die. And the serpent says to her, you shall not surely die. If you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as the gods. That's what he says to her. And then it says, so she looked at the fruit and saw that it was pleasant to the eyes and a fruit to be desired to make one wise. So she reached out and took the fruit and ate of the fruit. And she gave unto her husband to eat. And what, in fact, then happened to them when they ate of the fruit? They became... Well, in the words of the, the Bible itself, the eyes of them both were opened, just as who said would happen. Right? Now, if you look at this tale of the serpent in the garden, he is Nachash. Nun Chet Sheen. Nun Chet Sheen was the name of the serpent. Nun, 50. Chet, 8. Sheen, 300. What's 300 plus 50 plus 8? 358. 358. Okay, now we have prophecies about Meshiach. Who was Meshiach? Messiah. And how do you spell Messiah? Mem, let me see. Mem, Sheen, Yod, Het. Mem is 40. Sheen is 300. Yod is 10. Chet is 8. So 358. So 358. Now is this a coincidence that the Messiah and the serpent have the same number? No. It's not a it's, no, it's not at all. And if it was an isolated case, you might be able to dismiss it as coincidence. But it is it is far from an isolated case. Showing that there's a deeper meaning behind the dichotomies presented in the scripture. So that's 358. What's 358? Well, for one thing, it's the first three terms of the Fibonacci sequence, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, etc., which is the logarithmic spiral, perhaps the serpent's coil, mm. but it's also the prophecy. And you can go into these prophecies, and by using the Kabbalistic techniques of interpretation, you can discover 
that there are, again, numbers. And in a, in a future presentation, I will do a whole thing on Kabbalistic <coughs> numerology in the Bible, is which is extremely one, interesting. Is that one where the child would, um, until he ate butter, butter and honey? Even <coughs> Pardon me? He wouldn't eat butter and honey till shallow came? Is that the one you're... No, um, it's... Um, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's what it says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now the phrase, until Shiloh comes, I won't translate it into letters, but if you add it up, it's 358. So this was taken by Kabbalists as being a reference to the Meshiach, or the Anointed One. Now what was the Anointed One? What was he anointed with? Oil. 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 Christ, Crisco means oil, like Crisco oil. Like well, Christ and Chris, Christ, uh, Crisco case is word from Christ. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Crisco came from Christos, huh? See, the ancient knowledge is everywhere about us in everyday use. Wow, it's true. The symbol of wisdom. The symbol of what? Yeah. Wisdom. Wisdom. Yes. And the caduceus. Well, you have yes. Here, here's this duality of the serpentine symbolism. On the one hand, the serpent can be evil, but on the other hand, a serpent of wi uh, uh, a symbol of wisdom and healing. Be, be as wise as. And this is why I think you have Meshiach and Netzach representing some kind of a fundamental cosmological duality. But it's like knowledge can be used for good or evil. I mean, the same knowledge can be used. For good or evil. <clears throat> This is true. Be as wise as serpents. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? Be ye wise as serpents. Maybe he was saying be ye wise of serpents.